you shot him once, he fell over. You weren't sure where the gun was, so you shot him another, what, five, six times to make sure he was dead? It sounds like murder. All right, y'all, welcome back to Coming Arms Channel. Okay, today we're checking out something about the Metropolitan Police over in the UK. Now, as far as my understanding, I, I Googled the Met Police a while ago. I think it's just for like the, the greater London area, kind of like their jurisdiction. But this is titled Inside Met Police Firearms Center, where London cops train for raids, shootings, and terror attacks. So uh, yeah, definitely an interesting title. Um, so this is by The Sun, it's about 14 minutes long, but it looks like it's gonna give us some pretty in-depth kind of background as far as what the Met Police do, what their jurisdiction is, and kind of how they train for their kind of uh, specific mission set. We haven't checked out many videos about the British police, except maybe like the CTSFO and then uh, maybe a couple others. But yeah, this seems like it's gonna be a pretty good comprehensive video to kind of give us a good understanding of this pretty prominent police force. So should be cool, let's check it out. Okay, let's see how much of my shirt gets chroma keyed out. Okay. <laughs> uh, not too bad, just the, the reptar there. <laughs> this is the Met Police Training Center for armed officers in Gravesend, Kent. Oh, snap. Here, the elite officers tasked with responding to London's life and death incidents learn how to take and save a life. My name is Mike Sullivan. I'm the Sun's crime editor, and I've been granted access behind the scenes <laughs> to see for myself the extreme pressure and intense scrutiny that officers go through Damn. when responding to such danger. Do these simulations are always like so old. I don't know why they don't have like more modern ones, but okay. It is cool to have these simulators for these police because again, it kind of challenges their mindsets, but also kind of um, the legality aspect of when to engage, how to use like the continuum of force. And yeah, they're, they're just very helpful tools. This is crazy though. It looks like they have a whole armament just to kind of familiarize themselves with a bunch of different guns. To such dangerous situations. That's a cool shot. On average, there are around 4,000 armed incidents a year in the capital, and another 800 pre-planned operations which officers who carry guns will turn out on. Those cops More than I respond thought. to them are in units that have undergone hundreds of hours of extra training before they're deployed onto the streets. It's one of the most dangerous areas of policing, and not just a physical danger, but the risks that officers carry in terms nice. of the backlash from the law afterwards. They not only risk their lives, but also their freedoms. Yeah, that's a crazy. That's what a lot of y'all were telling me about. Like <clears throat> a lot of the police officers didn't feel comfortable, you know, having that extra qualification to carry firearms because of the backlash and potentially making the wrong call or, you know, it being seen as the wrong call and getting a lot of backlash, which, you know, as a cop, especially one, you know, if you, if you need to kind of deal with like a lethal situation potentially, um, I would not feel very comfortable if I did have to resort to using my firearm. And that can be helpful to a point just so you, you're really kind of stressing the continuum of force and not, you know, applying too much uh, force basically to a situation. But again, when you're talking about like terror situations, potentially, you want people who are going to be comfortable uh, employing their firearms if they really need to, if it gets that bad. September of last year, Around 300 of them downed their weapons in protest after a colleague was charged with murder. Following that rebellion, then Home Secretary Joella Braverman ordered an accountability <laughs> review of policing to establish whether officers were being treated fairly under the current system. Hmm. Met Police Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley is calling for urgent reforms to make things fairer for his officers, who can sometimes face years of scrutiny for their handling of life and death incidents. Damn. I've come here to the Met's training facility hmm. to understand what goes into making an armed officer and how they react when they're facing dangers on the streets of the capital Damn. to protect the public. This guy's like high speed, man. Specialist Firearms Command in the Met is known as MO19, and we start our tour in the museum where the scale That's of the capital's firearms problem it's clear to see. Whoa, what the heck? I'm trying to see if it had like an interesting coating on it. 
but I think it's literally just a very, very old Desert Eagle. That's cool. This one was made by a prisoner uh, in one of Her Majesty's prisons, made in the machine shop, and then subsequently wow. found on a prison search. Uh, it fires a single shot, 2-2 two -two bullet. Damn, that's well done. This one uh, is a large caliber target revolver <laughs> with a machine grip for Laser a machine blaster. to an individual's hand with a suppressor and a, an optical sighting system on it. Suppressor? Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> really? I mean, I guess you might have some kind of baffle system here. Um, it, it's kind of hard to suppress a revolver, though, but interesting. I mean, especially with the whole cylinder Large and Large caliber target shooting. This yeah, is more like... of a conventional, what we class as a self-loading pistol. And so and it's semi-automatic. It's not fully automatic. Um, very, very common, comes in many different forms. Works on a, ma a magazine with bullets in it, and as soon as you squeeze the trigger after making it ready, the gun will recycle itself. I say it will put another round in the chamber to make it ready to fire again. Mm. This is 90% of modern day weapons will work on, on pistols. Not all the items here can kill you, and it's hard to know, even close up, whether oh, a like firearm is guns? genuine or not. So yeah. all the, uh, the weapons that are on this side, uh, are all completely fake. They're completely inert. Oh, we'll the Desert Eagle is too, huh? Whatsoever. Uh, the weapons that carry on this side are real, viable guns and will discharge a bullet. There is no visual difference. Weight is quite a key thing, but to hmm. work out that it's heavier than something else, you've actually got to be that close to pick it up. But again, like as a cop, if somebody's raising a, an airsoft gun to me, Unless I can like, even if I can see an orange tip, I don't know, some people might just be crazy and paint like an orange tip on a real firearm, just, you know, so they can get that extra split second, you know, for you trying to decide whether to shoot or not. But it shouldn't be such a crazy thing for them to decide, okay, if somebody's pointing this airsoft gun at me, should I, you know, start firing on them? Because, you know, if you hesitate and it is a real gun, then that's it. Um, so it's, kind of crappy for them if that's like a really big issue that they're dealing with like airsoft guns or replicas is being really kind of nervous um, in identifying it because it's going to be very very hard especially depending on the Angle. distance and as for what officers might encounter on the street it's very hard to tell nowadays hmm. it, it, it really really is i mean this, some of the stuff in here is, is up to 100 years old some of it is relatively modern it's, you really do not know Damn, they got you really everything just, just don't know what is currently out there hmm that's cool, you can like identify some of the there weapons and whatnot. There are around 3,000 firearms officers in the Met who carry out different roles. All of them must complete a set amount of training each year to keep their firearms blue ticket. For senior officers, hmm. that can total 250 hours of training annually. Damn. Holy cow. And these guys probably that just have fun doing it. was a training <laughs> scenario in relation to I know either I would. a cancer terrorist exercise or a hostage rescue where upon life is at risk. Uh, and that particular method of entry Dude. is utilized where life is at risk or other exceptional circumstances. Hmm. The next exercise we're shown is modeled on the Bataclan theater attack in Paris back in November 2015, in which 130 okay. people died. We have a club what? premises here, so two floors. Uh, we, there's no light inside there apart from strobe lights. Really? We have loud music, Damn, is... so we're looking at taking out um, a lot of the senses that, that police up. officers and everyone uh, deals with. So they're going to go in. There's two armed suspects inside the club, uh, multiple injured people inside. So we deploy the two ARVs to save life in, inside the address. So their main role there is to um, hopefully to confront and neutralise the threat. Shots fired. What is that? Why are they going without helmets? Interesting. Two ARVs to save life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In inside the address. So their main role there is to... Uh, yeah, so this is not the CTSFO, um, which made a little more sense with that um, entry there. Hopefully to confront and neutralize the threat. Shots fired. You guys need to make, get a foothold into that building. In this scenario, officers storm a nightclub before assessing the carnage which the terrorist suspects have inflicted. Downstairs, we have four fatalities and one person with a penetrating chest wound. 
Upstairs, there's a large number of people that um, have got catastrophic bleeds or penetrating chest wounds from the gunshots. So we've got two, what we call nesting sites, one upstairs, one downstairs. One upstairs is okay, the yeah. one. So if we go in, we can unwalk you through it. So as soon as there's no longer a threat, they just have to stop. They have to uh, spin, change caps, or almost like a medic cap. And yeah. from there, they just like triaging everybody inside that building. So you have to find everyone, treat everyone, stop them bleeding, keep them breathing. Once everyone's been found and you've done that rapid intervention, life-saving uh, treatment, then you can get onto comms, get everyone to come, come to you to help you. But then once yeah. you've got that time, then you start doing real medic and work. So we're looking at stripping them down, finding the wounds that are going to kill them slow, um, expose the wounds that are going to, we're going to kill them quick, get mm. oxygen, those that need oxygen. That's good the training airways, there. The people that are unresponsive. Um, from then onwards, we just need to keep them warm, get help to us as quick as Especially possible. Especially with the mannequins and the, the me, real, need to go to hospital. Not real survive, casualties. Just laying on the floor with our treatment. The real people. Have ARVs dealing with someone that's been attacked, that had acid thrown on them, stabbed, run over, shot. ARVs the are the acid best thing people is so cruel. Cool. I don't get that, trauma. man. It's crazy. We get with emails to say that their initial interventions have saved life, and if it wasn't for them with their skills and the kit that they've got, these people would die. What can you even do against like acid attack? Like, I mean, try and dilute it and rinse it off, maybe. But I feel like even still, then it's gonna. I don't know, it's just wild. Like, it, it's so crazy when I started hearing that that was a, a thing. I'm, I'm not sure how like, you know, prominent it actually is in the UK, but I mean, just resorting to throwing acid on people because you're like that desperate to hurt them is so odd. Firearms officers can use their medical training to respond to life-threatening situations that may not involve weapons. And oh, they Jesus. often do. So this is enhanced medic training. <laughs> I think Those she's two dead. Those vehicles down there are uh, armed response vehicles. And you can see we've got a number of casualties uh, yeah. in the street, live casualties as well. So the instructors are finding out from the students at the moment what the injuries are. The students are making their assessment of those injuries and then responding accordingly. Last year, more than 800 incidents were attended by firearms officers which did not involve guns and which required hmm. specialist medical help. Okay. They save lives as well as rarely, on occasions, taking them. Hmm. The guys and girls. Yeah, it's cool. If you have that advanced training, it makes sense for them to help. They consistently and persistently respond to 999 calls. 66 times uh, during November, they responded to life saving incidents outside of firearms incidents. Hmm. One of the first exercises potential firearms undergo. It's a simulated incident in the judgment range, aimed at judgment testing the officer's ability to make decisions under extreme pressure. Obviously, mm. it replicates the handgun that they would normally have, but like I say, it's just full of electrics. I know you've had a squeeze okay. of the trigger, and if you pull it, it will make a bang. <laughs> so the system will pick up the bang. Okay, the system yeah, okay, knows okay. where the laser's pointing at the time when it makes the bang, so it shows where it where the person's been shot. Yeah, so we have a lot of things like this. It's not always like a scenario kind of thing, but there are a lot of electronic trainers or ones that kind of use like gas. Um, some of the older ones, they have like tubes attached to some of the guns, but now, uh, you know, they kind of just fill the magazine up and you get a little bit of recoil. And then of course it like registers, the, you know, where it's actually supposed to be firing because they calibrate it and stuff. It's pretty fun. The instructors can change the outcomes of the scenario as they play out presenting officers with alternative endings to the incidents. So you drive past a school, yeah. uh, there are multiple uh, phone calls about uh, an active shooter, many people, children, Just by himself. someone's been shot, someone's been shot, then you have to do um, like a single person emergency entry to confront that shooter. Yeah, okay. So other units are on that. Yeah, I go for it. So you might come across some other cops, so don't shoot them. I think I'd, I'd shoot most criminals, so I'd feel very comfortable doing that. Jesus. Okay. Stick the gun down. We'll play the video back, yeah. and it will stop on each round you fired, so we can see now on the screen how it pans out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I reckon it's gone through mm -hmm. his arm and, and into that, green. yeah, into her sternum. It yeah, it was ouch. So you shot the girl in the green. As the scenario played back on screen, 
instructors rigorously interrogated my decision That's cool. making, it shows and I have like to that. admit it wasn't up to much. So the person with the gun, were they definitely the person that had shot the casualties? He had a, a gun. He was yeah. up, uh, holding up a gun, and mm -hmm. the Maybe people more. in that room were frightened of him. Oh, well, that's a single that's headshot right there. Maybe a student that had taken the gun off the marauding gunman, and he's holding the gun, going, "Wow, that's amazing! I managed to get the gun off the bad guy, and he's run off." What? What kind of stupid thought is that? Are they really telling their police that? I mean. Just look, look at the body language. Look at their body language. I mean... He had a... What? Okay, I, I understand he's maybe trying to, like, think outside the box, but, like, if you start th saying stuff like that, then the cops are going to be like, well, what's the right answer here? Because, like, am I supposed to shoot this guy? I mean, it's pretty the evident gun, that... He's holding up a gun, and the people in He's probably not just a student them. that's like, oh, they yeah, I got the gun, like cool. Them. Maybe a student that had taken the gun off the marauding gunman and he's holding the gun going wow that's amazing i managed to get the gun off the bad guy and he's run off so innocent student hero maybe everybody relax police officers look i've got the gun i've taken it off him everyone's safe now i'm the hero bang 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 dead i thought that they were standing Just back against the wall what um and that to me suggested that they were in fear the only one that thinks is like really dumb <laughs> Kind of thought process. So when you shot him and he fell on the floor, mm. did he drop the gun? I did look to see if he still had the gun, and I didn't see it. You didn't see the gun? No. So why did you shoot him again? Because I just wanted to make sure he was dead. I mean, you're saying you wanted oh, to yeah. make sure he was dead, so that's attempted murder, even if he doesn't die. Yes. I thought he was a risk to the other people but in the room. Because of the gun? Because of But the you gun. didn't know where the gun was. What do you mean? Point, no. What do you mean he had, he had the gun, he was very clearly a threat? I don't, again, I don't know if they're just trying to give him, like, shit, and they'd be like, yeah, these are things you need to think about. That's just dumb. Like, it, it's, like, almost common sense. They're clearly in fear of this dude who's holding it. You shoot him. Yeah, you might not necessarily see that the gun, like, moved away from him. So, yeah, you're going to keep shooting it until you make sure that that threat is neutralized. Again, making sure you're not, like, shooting through him and hitting somebody who's innocent. But, I mean, yeah, you're going to make sure the dude's down. Uh, of course, you always want to like scan, make sure you know there's no other threats that you need to engage as well before you do like a mag dump into somebody. But eh, a weird thought process. Oh my gosh! If they're actually thinking like this, I would not feel comfortable as a cop. Again, you kind of need to understand how to assess the situation and make that call. But I think in this situation, it is very, very clear that the dude is the threat. Um, but. Yeah, I don't know. Weird. Could you see both his hands? No. What colour was the floor? White. And what colour was the gun? Black. So pretty easy to, yeah. to see the gun. Couldn't take the chance that he didn't still have that gun and would therefore be a risk to the other people in the room. Yeah. Do you think you shot him in the back? I think I did. You didn't consider that he might not be able to hear and you just shot him in the back. You shot him once, he fell over. You weren't sure where the gun was, so you shot him another, what, five, six times to make sure he was dead? It it sounds like murder. murder. The experience was quite humbling. Hopefully, what do you mean? How is that murder? You would shoot the bad guy, he would fall over, drop the gun. You wouldn't shoot him anymore. You would go forward, secure the gun, and give life saving first. Dude, am I tripping? Like, this is like actually mind blowing to me. I, I, there's so, it's like these people have never even considered like the psychological effects of combat or the physiological effects of combats. You get so tunnel vision, you get the positive identification, make sure it's a threat, and then you engage. Like, you're not going to necessarily track exactly where the gun fell. And again, like he's saying, he couldn't see the hands, he didn't know if he still had the gun. So again, you're going to engage a threat and make sure that the dude is not you know, going to harm anyone or, you know, potentially taking that firearm and start shooting back at you. I don't understand how you can make the argument that this is murder. Like, you're going to shoot the dude once and then just be like, oh, yeah, he's good. What if he has, like, a knife or another gun? I'm not going to, like, feel comfortable just approaching. Again, maybe I'm, like, I'm, I don't think I'm tripping. I think I'm very reasonable in what I'm saying here. But, um, yeah, I would not want to be on the police force if they're telling me stuff like this. Kill the gun and give life-saving first aid until the ambulance gets there, they take him away, everybody's happy. 
I felt mentally fatigued from my first attempt. But on Negative. the second occasion, I was more successful. You've dropped off your colleague. Uh, there is a, a, a domestic uh, dispute. We're pretty successful the first neighbor attempt, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, to the Except next for the door shooting. Neighbor. Shouting and arguing, inaccurate. And shouting and arguing a few times. Please present yourself. Control basically say there have been a number of calls to that house in the past three months. Police have gone. There's uh, there's never been any injuries. There's never been any sign of disturbance. Both the creepy ass house. And the house have said it was just a loud disagreement. Control that appears to be nobody present at the, this address at the time. Now going up the stairs. There are voices. Please, Is the power just cut? Why don't they turn the lights on? Control. Jeez Louise. So going through the, the police. Humans got smoke checked. You announced yourself as police. Certainly in the initial bit I didn't see anything. Dude had a knife and then all of a sudden she's like, anything. Yeah, you know, let me stop. Do you notice anything that seemed a bit out of the ordinary? What the fuck? There are no definitive outcomes. What kind of situation is that? Is. More important is testing the officer's ability to focus under extreme pressure. And I don't know, it's like if you dude if you're grabbing a knife and you're going after your whatever spouse, I guess, like You've Justify gone off the deep end a bit. Face with the decision to take I don't think you're going to walk off the ledge then, that quickly. Or, you know, get backed off the ledge that quickly. Yeah, sounded to me like a, hmm. a distressed woman and a, okay. a male voice that seems to be threatening. This is not an exact science, as human factors are involved. Mistakes can be made, sometimes with fatal consequences. But there is no doubt from what we have seen about the rigorous and professional training which these officers undergo. That's a goofy scenario. I mean, you can do a lot of damage with a knife at this distance in a very, very short amount of time. Like, this dude is tripping. And again, this is coming from like the American perspective, but this looks like some very challenging policing as far as what they're kind of saying and how difficult they're making it. Like you shoot the dude once and then you need you need to immediately render aid. Like the dude is trying to kill people. He actively did, you know, kill people and then had hostages. I mean, you're probably not just going to shoot him. He's going to be like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm done. He's probably going to be freaking crazy and he's probably going to be trying to kill people basically until, you know, the, after he's shot and whatnot. So, hmm, I don't know. It's... um. I, again, I understand that you always want to try and de-escalate as much as possible. Or, of course, you know, if you, if you shoot them, you neutralize the threat. You can see that the weapon is clear. You still want to take a tactical pause and, you know, reassess, see if there are any other weapons before you just kind of immediately move up to, to render aid. Because, again, if you just walk up and all of a sudden the dude starts stabbing you, then, yeah, it can end up pretty bad for you. So, yeah, just, yeah, tricky. Well, yeah, I'm curious what you guys think. Um whether it be Americans or people from you know, other countries, or of course the UK. Let me know what you guys think about the kind of explanation that he provided. I think the dude who is kind of going through the training, I think he was making a lot of sense. He seemed pretty prudent in how he was describing it. He's like, yeah, I didn't necessarily see the gun exactly, kind of where it went. I couldn't see his hands. I didn't know if he was still a threat, uh, but I know he was a threat. He killed people. And you can kind of, again, make that assessment, get that positive identification that he is that threat just by, you know, he's holding the gun. These people are cowering in fear. He's kind of walking back and forth. It's, it's all pretty obvious to any reasonable or prudent person. But yeah, let me know your thoughts. Again, I'm kind of coming from the American perspective. And again, as someone who carries firearms to defend himself um, pretty, pretty regularly, yeah, it's... Um, uh, those seem like pretty easy calls to me, and the fact that they're getting so much pushback, yeah, I would n I would not feel very comfortable um, in in making a whole lot of decisions to actually employ my firearm if that was the case. But yeah, 
Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed. Let me know what you guys think, of course. And if you have anything to recommend that's similar to this, kind of like case studies, 